retirement. Say goodbye to ever retiring. We're living longer than ever. How are we going to fund it? What age are we going to retire? What are we going to live on when we retire? Welcome to this week's edition of Money Matters. Because as you know, I deeply, truly believe that money does matter. So I recently saw this article. The person that's done the investigation is called Vicky Spratt. She's 36 years old, and what she's saying is, in your 30s and 40s, say goodbye to ever retiring. She's basically saying that as a child, I spent a lot of time with my uh, grandparents during their retirement, watching them as they gardened, volunteered, played golf, traveled the world, and drilled into their grandchildren the importance of saving. Retirement, she says, in this article, looked like so much more fun than being at school. It was one long summer holiday. I don't know if you've got that memory of your grandparents. I certainly do. They lived into their 90s. They did retire at 60 when she married, as was normal. She had a couple of kids and she, she never worked again. She was, she was a housewife. And granddad's income, teacher's income, so, you know, not some mega job in the city making millions, that he did property on the side. He bought a big field in Essex, uh, built a bungalow, so he did a self-build, and then sold off half of his big garden to Essex County Council, and they built a massive housing estate on it. He made a load more money through property. But nevertheless, my grandparents lived into their 90s, fantastic long life, had what I perceive to be a very nice lifestyle towards the end, you know, well, I say the end, the last 35 years of their life, which is quite a long time, isn't it? And they were never struggling. And it sounds like Vicky had a kind of similar experience. Now, at 36 years old, I'm realizing that my sunset years, should I be lucky enough to live that long, might not look quite as relaxed as my grandparents did. And she goes on to say, I'm theoretically in a good position. I'm able to work. I earn an above average salary. I've not got one, but I've got two pension plans. So she's paying into two separate pension plans. I own my own home and I'm overpaying my mortgage. Does this sound familiar? In her mid fifties, she'll have that mortgage paid off. She's talking about annuities, but basically the amount of money she's got saved up, she will buy an annuity with it. She's expecting annuity rates to be about 4% and she's assuming that that will give her about £40,000 a year. If you back calculate that, what that tells me, she doesn't say in the article, that she's expecting to have £1 million saved up in her pension schemes by the time she retires. And she can't see a future for her that allows her to have a good retirement because again, she's very intelligently saying, well, if I've got a million pounds in, well, in her case, 24 years time by the time she's 60, 4% of that is £40,000, but I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to live on that. And she's quite right, because of inflation. Just think about that. In 26 years' time, what will £40,000 allow you to do? Well, think back 26 years to the 1990s. Inflation destroys the value of money. But here's where it starts to get scary, because the average Brit, according to the Daily Telegraph, doesn't have savings of a million pounds by the time they retire. They've got savings of £110,000 their private pension will be £4,000, not 40. And even on 40, she's saying that she doesn't think she'll be able to cope. Later on in the article, she's saying, for instance, that adult social care, you know, if you needed a care home, if you needed a nursing home, the government's put all this guff, and it really is guff, I'll do a separate video about it, that you need to pay £86,000 and that's it. That's not true. You've still got to pay for your accommodation. So some elements, like your medical care, there's a cap on, but it depends on the kind of medical care. So she's saying that it could easily cost her five, £6,000 a week, even if you're above average, even if your salary is such that you can afford to pay off your mortgage by the time you're in your mid-50s, even if that home is worth three, four, five hundred thousand. As soon as you need care in old age, the government is going to take it off you. Because if you've suddenly got to start paying four or five thousand pounds a week, and they won't give you support until you've got like, you know, twenty thousand pounds left or whatever it is, they'll start paying for little bits and pieces, but you won't get full support until your million pounds of, you know, assets or half million pounds house that's been paid off or whatever it is, is down to 20 grand. One of my great aunts, Peggy, she went into a care home uh, age 75, 76, and she was worth two million quid. By the time she died, when she was 96, she was worth 16,000 pounds. So from two million to 16,000, gone. Nothing to leave for the next generation. Vicky's saying the same thing. What could she do? She's got an above average salary. 
But let's say she's got a half million pound house, just for the sake of an easy number. She could put a 300,000 pound mortgage on it, even though she's paid it off, or she could just stop paying it off, and she could have 300,000 pounds of money, which is a mortgage. She could then go and buy some buy to lets, she could go and buy some service accommodation. So she'd have essentially a 300,000 pound war chest, and she could go and turn that into millions. And even if you just did something simple, like you took that 300,000 pounds, assuming that's a 25% deposit, you'd get 1.2 million pounds worth of property. That on its own would give you passive income, 2,000 pounds a month after you pay for everything. And every 10 years, the capital value of those 1.2 million pounds worth of properties doubles. Let's say she wants to retire in 30 years time. 1.2 million now, in 10 years time, by the time she's 45, uh, will have gone to 2.4. But in 10 years time, by the time she's 55, that'll go to 4.8. Then in 10 years time, by the time she's 65, that'll go to 9.6, let's call it 10 million quid. So, <laughs> I mean, even if she just bought a million pounds worth of property now and kept it for 30 years, it's gonna be worth a lot more. Now, I've been a property investor now for 42 years. I bought my first flat back in 1982 and I paid 9,000 pounds for it. That same flat is now worth between four and 500,000. Will the same thing happen again over the next four years? Yes. The way she's doing it at the moment, she's, she's taking money and she's just dumping it into pension funds because she wants to get to a million quid. I think she could get to 10 million quid. So that's thing one. Thing two, and perhaps more importantly for Vicky, and if you're massively risk averse and you just want to be super safe, how about instead of saving on a monthly basis into your pension fund like she's doing, you save into a different kind of pension fund, a SIP or a SAS. Now I've had SIPs and SASs for 25 years. So assuming you live in the UK, you can have a self-invested personal pension, SIPP, also known as SIP, not attached to a company, just in your personal name, or more flexible, this is what I prefer, small self-administered scheme, SSAS. So let's say that Vicky, instead of putting money into a pension scheme, she invests in a SIP, and then she uses that SIP or SAS to buy commercial property. The first shop I ever bought 20 plus years ago, I've still got it, and I paid quarter of a million for it. So even if she got to the very end of her plan and she had a million pounds. She could buy four of them, couldn't she? The average income over the next 10 years for that shop is 38,000 pounds. 2,000 pounds a year off of her 4% annuity, to take you back to the very start. But she could have four of them. So instead of having 40,000 pounds that dies with her because it's an annuity, annuities die with you, nothing to leave to the kids or you know, future generation. She could have four of them. So she could be on 160,000 pounds. It's in a SAS, a SAS is a trust, a trust is exempt from inheritance tax, so she's still got the shops when she passes away. And every year the shop rent goes up, her income goes up. Vicky, if somehow miraculously you see this, can we talk? What I'd love to do, by the way, Vicky, is I'd love to do a 10, 15 minute video with you just to explain to you what your options are. Because I don't want you and people like you thinking, I can never afford to retire. Financially, you're doing really well. You're saying you've got an above average job salary wise, you're paying off your mortgage, you're saving in two different pension schemes, and yet you're still saying, I'm not gonna be able to retire. Within 10 minutes, I can show you how to retire, not on 40,000 a year, but on 160,000 a year, and pass on millions and millions of pounds worth of assets to future generations, and unlock that lazy money in your house, and you're only one phone call or one Zoom call away. No fees, no charge. I would just love to have that conversation because I wanna help you or someone like you. If you're not Vicky watching this, but you're like Vicky, you've maybe got a 100,000 pound a year job, a half million pound house that you're paying off, and you're gonna have a one million pound pension lump sum, and you thought you couldn't retire, and you're in 30s or 40s. If that's you, contact us. Just put something in the comments below, contact us, and let's have a chat. I would absolutely love to show you some alternatives. It's up to you whether you do it or not. I won't charge you a bean because you and me talking would educate tens of thousands, hopefully millions of other people. And that is more than any money you could ever give me. If you want to even just see somebody have that conversation with me, you know, about the whole SIP, SAS, commercial property thing, put some comments below. You've been wonderful. I've been Paul. See you next time.